On Boxing Day, the worst natural disaster in 40 years hit the coastline of Asia. As the scale of the devastation became apparent, people across Scotland donated millions of pounds. For some, giving money wasn't enough. We can build up their confidence again and get them back on their feet. That would be our aim. We know the most important thing for them is to go back in the water and to be in charge of their own lives and to have their boats fixed. We have been looking for you for two weeks. <laughs> oh, really? oh, that, no. that group of people have just worked from their heart, really, haven't stopped to think about what they're doing, why they're doing it, just felt it and come. Tonight on Frontline, we follow the individuals who put everything aside to help. But what difference can they make to the shattered coastal communities of Sri Lanka? From, the, from Hikadua, basically. Neil Butler from Glasgow feels lucky to be alive. He and his wife and children escaped unharmed when waves struck their guest house in the Sri Lankan coastal resort of Hikadua. But the destruction Neil saw that day has made him determined to help. And now, just two weeks after the disaster, he's getting ready to return. Well, I mean, it's all grown like topsy. It was just. We took it from friends, um, people ringing up, seeing how can we help and what to store. Neil's come to one of many churches across Scotland which have been gathering donations to see what he can take back with him. Groups, other churches, other places. I mean, they're all helping. The amazing thing for us is that the Buddhists and the local churches are working together. Yeah. Oh, but we already knew yeah. the water because oh, yeah. we've been together in the schools and so on and done stuff. So. Yeah, we're good neighbours. <laughs> well, good neighbours. Yes. Very good neighbours. Well, now we can be good neighbours on the other side of the world as of well. Of course, yes. <laughs> By the power of this to help him in the journey ahead, a blessing from a Sri Lankan Buddhist monk. I would like to give my blessings, wishing you all the best, good luck and safe journey. Neil is the owner of an events company. He specialises in organising large occasions like Glasgow's Hogmanay. He's got no experience of managing a relief effort. But his office is filling up with medicine for Hikadua. They now have more than 20 boxes. But as Neil prepares to leave, the airline will only allow him to take two suitcases. Neil's staff pack what they think will be the main essentials for the trip. What we'll have is I'm bringing some um, two or three cases full of drugs and things, medicine. So we need to um, take, so we can take those to the medical centre in Hikadua. It's a journey we've decided to follow. From the Sri Lankan capital Colombo, we head south to Hikadua. The impact of the tsunami quickly becomes clear. Niels persuaded Glasgow City Council to focus its aid effort in this area. We're now going to go into Hikadoa town and basically virtually every house and every building from along that stretch of road which is about um, a kilometre has been destroyed. The first part we come into is um, the fishing port. Those people who don't make their living from the port um, make their living through tourism. Um, so we're just going over the bridge now and the tidal wave went up through this bridge caused a huge amount of destruction because as it came up under the bridge um, it was also coming up from two other places and the three areas of water converged on the morning market which takes place every Sunday morning and there were probably going to well over a thousand and the water came up over this road through this land taking with it boats parts of buildings and vehicles and crushed and um, killed and a lot of people um, and many of them were washed along right into the interior through a system of paddy fields. Neil's guest house sits right on the beach. When the wave hit he was with his wife Nikki upstairs separated from their children Georgia and Alex. 
We ran out and just ran straight down here. So the water's just getting higher and higher. This wall was falling down. Then behind us, although we didn't know it, the wave was getting bigger and it was pulling down the back of the hotel. As we got to here, I remember that's, that's when it started getting deeper. The water and furniture and everything was pouring through the front door here. Um, we got through this gate. The gate sort of was just pushed up and we, we couldn't open it again because it was just um, too much pressure of water. And it was just getting higher and higher. And it was sort of, it got to the point, it was pouring over at this level here. We were on the other side. Then we managed to push the gate back and the water was starting to recede. Went back down there and Nikki was um, running down the beach trying to see where Georgia was and couldn't find her. And about, I suppose, an hour later, after it happened, we heard news that some of the kids were OK, but it was actually an hour and a half before we knew Georgia was all right. Neil's hotel escaped relatively unscathed. Further into Hikadua, houses, shops and the main rail line took the full force of the waves. This is um, really where, where Hikadua starts and um, all of these were houses and um, just over here is the, uh, the train and, and a lot of people obviously saw and read about what happened here. The water came from the sea just over there and went straight through all these houses, destroyed the houses, went into the train and the train was pushed onto its side. 1,400 people and only a handful of them survived. As we walked back to the road, we met Kumara. He took us to the remains of his house. His wife, mother-in-law, two sisters and two children were all inside when the wave hit. What is He found only the, his daughter's yeah. bodies. Just metres away, the sand is disturbed. The tire tracks are the only clue that here more than a thousand people were hastily buried in a mass grave. We're going back to Scotland and to raise money and we hope that we'll get some money and then we'll then hope to find you again and we can maybe help you. I found that really difficult actually. I think it's, so, it's to have a guy like that who's lost everything and then you just sort of stand and say, oh, I'm going to try and help you. I think that's just, you know, I, I, I'm not sure it's the right thing to say and I'm, I think he was just so distressed, you know, and I, I don't think there is anything you can say. I don't know. I just, it's just, it's very difficult. The first thing Neil needs is an overview of the scale of the problem from the local district secretary. She's coordinating how and where aid is delivered, but at this early stage, information is changing by the day. This first one is... Families affected. 9,332. Yes. yes. These are families, number of families. And this is people. This is people. T forgive me, is this Gaul or this is Hikadu? Hikadu only. Hikadu? Hikadu. This is Hikadu picture. All oh, this is Hikadu, okay. <laughs> so now I understand. Out of this number, yeah. this. Nearly... out of this family number, mm. affected this. So nearly one in three people. Yeah. One in three. One third like them. One third. We've got updated numbers of families affected and um, there's, there's much less, well, the good news is there's less people um, confirmed, killed. So in two days time um, we will know the, the number of boats and the number of nets and other things. Fishing details. Fishing details, yes. Yeah. How did it go? Very good, very good indeed. Um, they're really very interested and um, what she said was that there are just over 100,000 people in her district, which is a very big district, and 
of those, over a third have been affected. So either a, th a third of the entire population, they've either lost their home, their family members have died, or they've lost their, their work, their jobs, whatever. It's, so it's a huge um, impact. Scamar is one of those affected. He's lost his wife, two children, his home and his livelihood. When the tidal wave came, I was inside my home. My children were playing outside. My wife was also outside. Then I saw a few people were running and I came out. I thought they were running after a thief and I ran with them as well. When I turned around and looked, everything was flooded. As we were filming, Skamar's brother arrived and took us to where one of the children was buried. The dead body was there one and a half weeks. The body was just lying there and nobody came. All that is left now is suffering. Nobody is looking after us. We have nothing. Everything is washed away. These men are fishermen without a boat. Jeanette Smith, a teacher from Arran, has arrived down the coast near Gaul. Jeanette knows this part of Sri Lanka well. She was here for 10 years as an aid worker. And here is the bus stand. This is the shocking picture I saw on the 26th of December. Yeah. Completely flooded. People falling off the Buddhist the st statue and the, the bus going down the with the going people. By, by yeah, one by one they fell. All this. All this was covered and the cameraman was up in one of these buildings looking from a window and he shot the whole uh, area. And picked this up in all over the world. Like yes, all over the world, every day for two weeks. Yeah, I, I was so shocked when I saw that. Straight away she gave up her job as a teacher at Dungaville Detention Centre. Yeah. Jeanette's plan is to see if she can help another small village close to Hikadua get back on its feet. This is Lovi Gahavata. Yes. And this is the place you were telling me about that uh, has been completely gone by the waves. From the 55 houses that have just been smashed, how many people have died from uh, here? 70, 76 people is dead. And I think just by looking here, <laughs> it just brings it home to me, just uh, what must have happened on that terrible day. I can't imagine the sea has just come in there full force and smashed all these houses to pieces. To me, the devastation is just terrible. Um, I come from Scotland, from a small island called the island of Arran. And there, the people have been uh, wanting to support the Sri Lankan people. I can see that uh, there's a great need here, and I'm thinking that if, if the people of Arran maybe put their hands deeper into their pockets, uh, they might be able to help in some way. So just tell me first of all what's, you know, what we're doing today. Um, well, we're going down into Higadua town now, and we're going to the medical centre uh, with, with Chaminda, and we're going to talk to, find out who the doctors are, and make sure that we're going with the right place to deliver this medicine. We're directed to the nearest Buddhist temple where a medical team have set up camp. Hundreds of locals still sleep here every night. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Do you speak nice English? To you. Nice yeah. to meet you too. Hi. Uh, My name is Neil Butler. I'm from Scotland yeah. and we brought some medicine um, uh -huh. from Scotland and yeah. so we wanted to check if the best place for it to go to. Yes, thank okay. you. Okay. And we are the medical team from China. Yeah? No. How many people? The masks aren't to protect against disease, but protection against the dust, which is causing health problems. We found that the most of the patients, they have the upper respiratory infection. Yes. Maybe some, including asthma. Yeah. 
and common cold yeah. and headache. Yeah. And uh, once, uh, one third of the patients, mm. they got uh, trauma. Right. Uh, from uh, because of the tsunami. Sure. Yeah. How long have you been here? Uh, we have stayed here for ten days. Yeah. Uh, maybe we'll stay here for longer. Yes. The, the city of Glasgow. Glasgow. Glasgow is the biggest city in Scotland, yeah. Yeah. and we've made we've made uh, an organisation. Yes, Celtic and Rangers. <laughs> I was here when the tsunami hit. Where should we go? The nursing home in, in Glasgow that, that it was completely their initiative and they went to all the surrounding pharmacies, particularly one in Govan, and uh, they donated about 20 boxes of medicine. And th this is the, the prioritised medicine because I could only bring 50 kilograms with me. Do you know these things? These are um, lots, of, lots for. Um, so a lot of this is for surgery and for. Yeah, yeah. We did, we did also. Is this good yeah. things? Yeah. Oh, effort masks. Yeah. And even got cream. Yeah. Are these good things? Oh, this, this, this is good for us. Yeah. What does this do? Yeah. You fall here. And have any any medication for diabetes? I don't know. No. Night, can I choose? Oh, yeah, do it. Yes, of course. Nobody in Glasgow thought there'd be a need to treat asthma and diabetes. Most of Neil's drugs and equipment are aimed at emergency care. But what he's brought is useful. With several bags still full of emergency medicine, we head down the coast to the nearest hospital in Gaul. Here, there was another surprise awaiting us. The boxes in the hall suggest plenty of medicine has already arrived. These are drugs from Scotland. We are setting up a fund here for this area where Scottish people are giving money and they also give help and some people gave some drugs that we hope are helpful and it's a lot of equipment. Um. What has arrived? Uh, we received so many items uh -huh. from the other countries. And do you have enough in yes, the hospital? we have enough drugs. You have enough drugs? Mm -hmm. You do have enough? Every, mm -hmm. Yes, every country we have donated so many items. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So was that a bit frustrating? Or? Well, it's, I think it's. I think it's sort of probably is indicative of what's to come. Is that we're, we're at a stage now when um, certainly in Sri Lanka there's, there's very mixed provision. And when we were with the Chinese doctors in the camps, they, there clearly is a real need for a certain type of drugs, which are like they were saying to do with um, respiratory problems and things like this from the dust. But here, they clearly they've got plenty of drugs, um, and that, which is which is very good news. It, mean, it means that that's a whole area that, that perhaps we don't have to concern ourselves with. I, I, mean, I got the impression there that they're actually inundated with, with probably more things than they can deal with. Jeanette has brought toys for the children of Lovi Gahvat, but she hopes soon she can offer more to those she used to work with. Hello, I was excited about meeting the people I know, but of course, still aware that there's still I've still got to see a lot of unpleasant things, and uh, yesterday I, I did that. And so with the two now, I'm, I'm thinking, mm, it's a good idea I've come back. Maybe there is something I can actually do here. And um, in a year's time, say, what would you hope that you could have achieved? I would hope that we can really support the people in that small that village we saw yesterday and give them some hope. Because yesterday, from, from what I got from them, there was a sense of hopelessness there. And um, we can build up their confidence again and, and get them back on their feet to a certain extent. That would be our aim. Oh yeah, what a party! What a party! Hurry, what a party! Oh yeah, out. Huh? Hurry. Huh? Hurry. Patangan, a lot game. Patangan. Ah, how? Kia de? Ah, put it in the tuna. Yeah, chida, yeah, chida, yeah, chida, yeah, chida. Oh yeah. Eh, knock out. Game. 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 Game.
With charity money building up in Glasgow all the time, Neil wants to show that every penny can be accounted for. But at the nearest bank, there's a problem. Registering as a charity in Sri Lanka will hold everything up for months. Neil's realised it's easier if it's done back in the UK, where it's also less open to corruption. The thing is that it's a very politicised environment and that all of those, all the people who um, have a political interest wish to be associated with aid. And, and one, of the, one of the outcomes of that is, is that um, the, the president, for instance, would like to see the aid going through her committee. Um, the, uh, the Tigers want to see it going through theirs. There are many ways of dealing with that, and I think the main thing, one of the most heartening things is, is that meeting all the other people down the coast um, who are also engaged in the same activity and, and have come to identical conclusions. And that, that the conclusion is that the aid agencies um, will do a, a great job in, in, the broad, in, in the broad picture, but if you want money to go directly to the people who really need it, the people who, who know are the local people. And it's, and, and it's a very powerful combination when you get people who are European and have European contacts who can, who can pull money together, who understand the island, working with a network of, of um, uh, people from the island. The Sri Lankan coastline is littered with the remains of its fishing industry. The people are reliant on food being transported from inland, Neil is now sure that getting the boats back out to sea should be a major focus for the newly titled Hikadua Area Relief Fund. Neil's organised a meeting of all the local fishermen. They need to prioritise who needs what and find out the most economic way of fixing the boats. We know the most important thing for them is to go back in the water and to be in charge of their own lives and to have their boats fixed and to have nets and to have um, their engines working. Yes. The best way we, we can do that is to get, get the materials for fiberglass and materials to fix the boats yeah. and to get money to buy new nets or to yeah. fix the nets. Yeah. There is a, some boat can repair, yeah. some boat can't repair because yeah. it's too much damage. Yeah. So what, what we need to do is to understand what they need. Yeah. If they can say their name, they've got a damaged boat and what yeah. they need to fix it. Yeah. We are working with them first. Yeah. They have to be very careful with this information yeah. and they, th th we must get the best possible price <laughs> because if we get a bad price that means there's other people we can't help. Yeah. First on the list is William, who's now responsible for supporting his dead brother's wife and family. Their home's been flattened and they have no money to repair his boat. Fishing comes through our grandparents and ancestors. We don't have any place to go, we don't have any land. We only have the sea, that's why we fish. Sometimes the sea is so rough we can only earn a hundred rupees so we buy something to eat. That's the truth. That's how we live. If we don't have fishing, we can't live. We feel so very sad. We can't go fishing if we leave this land. William takes Neil to see his boat. It's only been slightly damaged and looks like it can be fixed quickly and cheaply. It's so okay to go. Yeah. This is about as small a boat as you can get. And they're, um, it's um, powered by paddle, by manpower. Neil's decided to concentrate on 26 boats to begin with. While some are simple, others will take a lot more work. Yeah. It's broken in that so many places, yeah. Near to the railway line, Westerners have set up an ad hoc camp. The Hikadua Area Relief Fund has paid for two Scottish medics to come and assess the situation. Dr Amanda Adler from Glasgow and Nurse Glenna Lovett from Perth volunteered their expertise. Initially we hired a van in Colombo, filled it with medical supplies, uh, started driving village to village to see what uh, needs arose in each place. For the last uh, 
12 or 14 days anyway. Yeah. So why did you pick on this bit? It was a good centrally located area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As resources uh, began uh, coming in, we mm -hmm. thought we could share them. Where are you getting most of your resources from? Initially, we were stopping trucks on the highway, uh, saying we need a bag of rice and some dal. Uh, a lot of people were coming media to check out the, the train mm -hmm. stuff, but mm -hmm. nobody was lending assistance. Mm -hmm. People were driving by with all this aid to get to Gaul, mm -hmm. and uh, the people were doing uh, pretty poorly. The volunteers are clearly providing an essential service. They're delighted to see Glenna. Wow, like so many people that haven't been attended. I'm talking about just a little of the picture that back home would be fixed. But, yeah, in, but now it's, it's big abscesses and you know we'll have to amputate these little tiny infections if they're not caught very soon. So things like that. But, but you'd be great because she could work with the pregnant woman. Yeah, it's midwife. Oh, that's great. Because <laughs> I'm sure there's going to be some. Baby's coming soon. I don't know how to do it. I, I, mean, I, could, I could. Oh, I used to be a midwife. We've been looking for you for two weeks. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. 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 Two then, weeks, I've been telling you every day. For Glenna, the visit to the camps already made it all worthwhile. Inspiring, upsetting, encouraging. The biggest thing was that that group of people have just worked from their heart really, haven't stopped to think about what they're doing, why they're doing it, just felt it and come and started it. And they've been successful. Do you think you can work with them? Hopefully, yeah. Yeah. Jeanette plans to work with the children of Lovi Gahavat for the next few months. Already, the people of Aran have raised £25,000 towards its reconstruction. <laughs> Back with the fishermen and a boat's ready for launch. We were able to give him just £60, that's all it took, and he was able to repair the boat and um, all his friends have been helping repair and putting in a new outrigger um, and uh, tomorrow he's going fishing. How does that feel? I think he's happy. Are you happy? Yeah, happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think mean, it's no. I mean, it's no. <laughs> yeah. But no, it's very it's amazing. It's very, very good. Uh, this is this the first one? This is the first boat of all those twenty six that we talked about before. This is the first boat to go in. And it's, I guess it's just very appropriate that it's a man like this who's you know, a very generous man, he's looking after a whole family. He's 70 years old and uh, it's great to see that he's the first to be helped. The total raised by the Hikadua Area Relief Fund today reached £300,000. We are immensely privileged to be able to just do really the small thing that we did to have a part in him getting his life back. I mean, the, the best possible thing about this is that those people who are proud people and generous people should be utterly independent and, and make their own decisions about where they want to be. And if we can be part of um, helping them into that position, then that's an enormous achievement.